Hi, welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I'm Greg Fitzsimmons. I'll be your host for this episode. I sure hope you enjoy it. How do you start a podcast? I'm sitting alone in a room for an hour putting this shit together and then you just start talking to nobody and yet so many people are listening. It's staggering. Not that many, but a good amount. I mean, I'm 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 on the map 13 years in, thousand and something episodes in. We just keep chugging along. I'm heading off. But actually, by the time you hear this, I will be in Ireland, the old sod, where my grandparents are all from. And we have no relatives left. Everybody got the fuck out because of the goddamn British. <laughs> Thanks, British. Thanks for making us feel at home, in our own home, you bastards. So we'll be over there. It's going to be my wife and kids, my sister and her husband and their two kids, my mom, my brother. we got a big house in Galway, which is on the West Coast. If you saw Banshees of Inishirin, that's where we're going to be. We're going to go to the the Aran Islands that are just off of there, which is where the film was shot. We're going to go out there for a day. We're going to go to, I guess there's some horse, there's the biggest horse race in Ireland is the weekend we get there. And then there's like some crazy falcon castle where you can watch falcons fly, I guess. I mean, look, I'm just going for the pub life, the sessions, the music, the people. I have great memories of Ireland. The the last time we were there, and I've been to Ireland probably four times. The last time we were there, I can tell you right now, was 22 years ago because my wife was pregnant with my son, Owen, who at the time didn't have a name. And we said, let's go to Ireland and find a name for Owen. So for whoever this baby is, we knew it was a boy. And so we were kind of like taking it in. And one of the names we heard was Owen. And in Gaelic, it's spelled crazy. It's like O-I-G-H-A-N or something. But we heard the name, fell in love with it. And uh, he was, he's was he been in Ireland before in utero. And my niece, Julia, was a year old when we were there. And she took her first steps in Ireland. And I got it on videotape. So she'll be there. Uh, the, 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 my two kids and my niece and nephew have been traveling around. They started in Budapest and now they're in Amsterdam and they sent me some pictures of them dancing on a bar in Amsterdam. I don't know what's going on. They say they're going to museums. I don't buy it, but I'm happy for them. Whatever, whatever they want to do. I don't give a shit. I traveled around Europe for six months when I got out of high school and I did a lot of drinking, but I still... Took it in. It's a great way to meet people. And they said they're not actually hanging out with any Americans. They're meeting a lot of Irish. They love the Irish. And uh, yeah, who knows what they'll do. When I was over in Ireland, when I was 18, it was me and my buddy uh, Pete Carr as I was traveling with him for the first part of the trip. Sneaky Pete. And we rented a house in Ken Mare, which is the town that my grandfather on my mother's side was from. Florence. The, the infamous Florence McCarthy. And we were in that house for about a month. And I fell in love with an Irish bartender named Molly. She had deep, luscious, red curly hair and green eyes and pale skin with little freckles. I mean, it was crazy. She was the picture of Ireland and the thick accent and the charm. And she was pouring me pints of Guinness every night. I fell in love with her. And I wrote a novel and I dedicated it to her. It was called Evergreen. When I say novel, it was probably like 100 pages, handwritten. But I gave it to her. It was in a notebook, and I gave it to her. And she kept it, so I don't have it. My first novel is out there. I'm, I'm sure Molly still has it. How would you throw something like that out? Impossible. So maybe I'll rediscover it when I'm over there. Um, What else? Let's get to it. Then we're going to uh, Mallorca after that. We are going to stay in a little town on the northern part of the island. And apparently everything's topless over there, which is going to be very awkward 
with my wife and daughter, but I will get some wraparound reflective sunglasses and make the best of it. The last time I was there was on that same trip. Uh, it was January, and I was freezing. And I said, I got to go warm up. So I bought a ticket to Majorca one way, and it snowed. It snowed for the first time in 40 years as I was trying to warm up. And so there was a, but the best part was there was a festival, St. Sebastian, which is my confirmation name. It's my middle name, basically. And the festival of St. Sebastian was taking place in Majorca. And uh, it was free. It was freezing, but people were dan- dancing in the streets, drinking all day, all night for like a week. It was amazing. Uh, so, so that was fun. So I don't know what festivals are going on in Majorca in the summer, but it's going to be hot as shit. I got Confederacy of Dunces. I'm going to reread it for the third time. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do. It's uh, my the funniest book I've ever read. Funnier than any anything by uh, John Irving or Kurt Vonnegut or uh, who else is funny? Uh, Philip Roth. Read it. Anyway, uh, been striking. Here's my shirt. Uh, I got the the Writers Guild strike. The actors have joined in, but it's not looking promising. I've talked to some people in the industry that are very high up. They don't believe this thing will end until like November. Uh, so uh, this whole town's going to be out of work. All the caterers, drivers, fucking tech people, editors. So we'll see what happens. I feel guilty that I'm going on vacation during the strike. I should be out there marching. But hey, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm uh, very excited to announce my fall dates. I have not announced them yet. Uh, this is the first time I will be uh, putting it out there. Get your pens and pads ready to write these down. Maybe I'm coming to your town. Escondido, California at the Grand Comedy Club, September 22nd, 23rd. Shirley, Massachusetts, October 5th. Manchester, New Hampshire, October 6th. Nashua, New Hampshire, October 7th. Sacramento at the Punchline, October 12th through the 14th. Arlington, Ale House, or Draft House, October 20 through 21. Baltimore, Magoobies, October 22nd, one night. Houston at the Riot, November 2nd and 3rd. And the San Francisco Punchline, November 30th through December 2nd. We're working on some other dates for the fall, but that's it for now. Go to fitsdog.com. Get yourself some tickets. Come out and see some live comedy. Why am I yelling? Look, I don't know how you guys feel about your wireless provider, your phone provider, Mine sucked. I don't know if I'm allowed to say which wireless service that I had, but they were really bad. They, you couldn't get anybody on the phone. You, uh, the, the service was spotty. Uh, it was extremely expensive. Uh, the big wireless providers are out to get you. They want to cut down on what they give you and charge you more and more. And there's, there's always a catch, you know? So when I heard about Mint Mobile, they've got premium wireless starting at, ready for this, $15 a month. What's the catch? There isn't one. It, it, everything is just simple. It, it, their secret sauce is they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores, pass the sweet savings directly to you. I signed up online. I switched over. I'm still using my same phone. Um, I'm finding that I'm getting the same, if not better reception that I got before. And I'm saving with the four people in my family. I believe we're saving about a hundred, $125 a month easily, if not 150, maybe. So if you hate your phone, premium wireless for 15 bucks a month is for you. Mint mobile. They give you the best rate, whether you're buying for just you or your whole family uh, family lines start at just two lines. It comes with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered. Data or data? Data delivered 
on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with Mint Mobile. Keep your same phone number with all your same contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your own new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Greg. That's mintmobile.com slash Greg. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Greg. Okay. The other thing we want to talk about is the stress of buying tickets, whether you want to go see music, perhaps sports, maybe live stand-up comedy, theater, anything you want to see, you're going to do it now, and you're going to use the Game Time app. Game Time is taking advantage of the fact that tickets go down in price. They got these last-minute deals that come up, flash deals. Uh, it's it shows you what's in your area. I'm looking right now at what's in my area, and we've got, uh, let's see, we got, hold on, hold on. Okay, we got the Dodgers. Dodgers are coming up, uh, $14 tickets. And let, let's be honest, you just get yourself inside the stadium. Don't worry about front row seats. Get in the stadium and walk down. That's my secret. Because why? I'm a 57-year-old man, and people just assume that I have tickets when I'm walking down there. If you see a 19-year-old, you're going to check to see the tickets. So if you're older, anyway, that's besides the point. Look, there's a low price guarantee if you find a uh, better price in the same section in a row the same night. They'll give you 110% of your ticket. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's time to stop stressing. You're always trying to time when to buy your tickets. Should I wait? Should I scalp out front? No, don't scalp out front. Couple taps on your phone, and this app just downloads the ticket and you show it. There's no transferring, there's no printing, there's no getting a, an email. It's all in your phone. It's a piece of cake. So what are you gonna do? Uh, you're gonna snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code FITSDOG for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code FITSDOG for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hey now. All right, listen, my guest today is a very dear friend who I have known for, I'm going to say 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. When I first started, he was a ticket taker. At a C room, if you can even call it a C room, maybe a D room up in um, Andover, Massachusetts. And then he went on to manage clubs and uh, he's had a very interesting life. He's a real Bostonian, born and raised in, uh, I think he's from Jamaica Plains or West Roxbury or something like that. He was a Boston City Council member. Uh, and he was the vice president of city and community affairs at Northeastern University. He has been since 2010. He's got kids. Uh, he's got a wife. He's got a life. He's got comedy clubs that he owns. He's one of the great storytellers I've ever known. I think nobody captures what the spirit of stand-up comedy in Boston is now and has been over the past like this guy. Um, comedy took a dip in Boston. There was a lot of clubs, and then there was one guy who was uh, kind of aggressively running the other clubs out of business until there was only one club left. And now John has brought that comedy scene back, and he's a big supporter of comedians, beginners, uh, as well as guys like Bill Burr stop in and perform his club when they're in town. Um, anyway... He's the best. I was so psyched to talk to him. We did this from the stage of his club, Laugh Boston, in Boston when I was there last month performing. And uh, here he is, the great John Tobin. All right, cool. Uh, hey, we're at uh, Laugh Boston on the, uh, what do you call this, the, the riverfront? Uh, the uh, seaport. The seaport here in the, the edge South of... The South Boston seaport. Well, it's not, it's not quite <laughs> South Boston. They, they love to say South Boston, 
because it sounds kind of edgier. Gritty. gritty. Sounds gritty. You expect to see like Sully on the corner scratching some lotto tickets and, uh, you know, three guys going to an AA meeting <laughs> angry. That's the, that's the thing is I got sober in Boston and it's not a, sur- they, they talk about the serenity prayer. Here's an Irish guy saying the serenity prayer. I, I promise. <laughs> How's the serenity prayer go? Uh, I want to uh, let go of the things I can change, change the things I can, and know, knowing the difference. And they're like, I'll change the things I can. <laughs> I'll know the difference. And like, remember that uh, <laughs> classic, um, that that classic bit from uh, who was the guy who was the, who was the big drunk? He did the Tonight Show. Teddy Bergeron. Teddy Bergeron just passed away. Uh, no, he didn't. Yeah, I went to his. Uh, he had a graveside uh, week uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Wow. Yeah. He what a was, talent. What a talent. This guy could perform. He not, not only had point of view, joke writing. Performance had it all. Just couldn't get to the show on time or stay sober, and so he had this joke about and ha- how these Boston guys in AA meetings, because he was in and out of AA for yeah, sure. his whole career, and he would talk about how on edge these guys were. They they were like, and I'm proud to sit in front of you people today and say that after 12 years, I no longer have the desire to drink. And he's like, and I'd be in the back, and I'd shake up a soda can and go, <laughs> and he'd be like, where is it? <laughs> three, three quick stories about him. One of his best jokes was he'd be sitting in the back of a theater during Peter Pan, and it would be a matinee, and all the kids are there, and Peter Pan's flying across the stage, and everybody's like, whoa, that's so magical. There goes Peter Pan. And he's in the back drinking. He's like, he's on a wire. <laughs> he's on a wire. He's not flying. Then he was on The Tonight Show. A, a night or two after he was on The Tonight Show, he was face down drunk in the gutter of Warrington Street outside Nick's Comedy Stop. And Don Gavin came upon him and looked down at him and said, weren't you on Carson last night? <laughs> and then... <laughs> Wait, he, because he got a big head about it. He did, yeah. yeah. And then we did Boston Comedy Festival, and I was involved with that 20 years ago. He entered into the contest. I remember we went out to Los Angeles to go recruit Boston expats to to come to the contest. Yeah. And I remember talking to you in the improv. You said, yeah, great. I'm going to fly across the country and enter a contest with Don Gavin. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but it turned out not a lot of headliners entered it because it's five minutes and the advantages yeah. to the openers and the features, right? Right. So, but Bergeron entered it one year. It was in the back room of Jacob Worth, the restaurant that had been there for 300 years yeah. in the theater district. German restaurant, old guy with a toupee playing the piano up front. Right. But the waitresses different... look like they started there. They started there, yeah. right? And so he, there's 10 people in the contest. There's like four or five judges. We took the top two every night in the preliminaries. He didn't make the top two, Teddy Bergeron. Oh. He went absolutely crazy, insane, like yeah. disrupted everybody's meal. He's screaming and yelling. Yeah. My, last, my last visual of Teddy alive was... Him underneath the back door of Jacob Worth, and it said Jacob Worth established 1723, and he says, "I will have this place shut down." <laughs> After 300 years, <laughs> the place of life, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, two world wars, <laughs> but it was not going to survive. Teddy Bergeron coming in fifth <laughs> in the Boston Comedy Festival. That was the last straw. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, we should back up for a moment, and we should get to know you, John Tobin. Here's a guy that I met, and it must have been, was it 91? 91 or 92, yeah. 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 And John was a ticket taker. <laughs> Pretty at, much. At this club. It was called the Grill 93, and it, which is about... Well, I met you before that. Oh, did we meet before that? At oh, Light Chips. Oh, right. We talk about that place. Well, I, I grew up loving stand-up comedy, and I wanted to be on what the... What town did you grow up in? I grew up in Mattapan, a neighborhood of Boston, then moved... Mattapan is black, though, isn't it? Yeah. 
Oh, it is now. But it was it was it was a pretty good mix. It was actually yeah. a Jewish neighborhood for for the forties, fifties, and sixties. Really? When you, when you ran for president in the forties and fifties and sixties, you stopped by the Jewish deli in Mattapan. No kidding. The G and G deli. Yeah. And that that was a must stop on if you were running for president of the United States. Right. Because um, I thought Patrice was from Mattapan as well. He's from Roxbury. Oh, he's from Roxbury, from Roxbury which yeah. is right next. Right door. next door. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, I I'm at the ra- I wanted to be on the radio in the worst way. That was one of the things that attracted me to you because I knew about your I knew about your dad. Yeah. And and I loved radio growing up. I just loved it. I wanted to be on the radio. I wanted to be on the radio and be the mayor of Boston. That's what I wanted to be. Uh huh. And um, so I actually you know, during my nine year sojourn through higher ed through college, I actually went to broadcasting school. Did you? What school? The Connecticut School of Broadcasting. No, you didn't. <laughs> I did. That's where Gary ba- Baba Booey went. Baba Booey. He did. Right? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of alums out of there. Who else went there? Oh, this is now you got to understand. This is a place that, like, on radio, you heard commercials for. Want to get a career in radio? Go to Connecticut School of Broadcasting. The guy's name was Dick Robinson. I'm Dick Robinson from the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. (laughs) (laughs) And and so I applied, and lo and behold, (laughs) I I got in. What are the odds? They took cash only. <laughs> cash and cadavers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but it was actually pretty interesting. It was good. Uh, they told me I was really good, but with my accent, I wouldn't get a job outside of Dorchester. Right. Right. It was because right. when you back in the day when you needed to have kind of that Midwestern dialect, speak yeah. from the diaphragm, and you know, you know, and you kind of had to lose your regionaliz- uh, regionalism. Uh, by that time, but, you know, if, if you graduated. To broadcasting school to start out, you had to go cover like eighth grade girls volleyball right. in Bangor, Maine. Yeah. Right. And no one would understand a, a word I'm saying. Right. So, but I started working at Kiss 108. My buddy Hank Morse got me a job at Kiss, and I worked uh, overnights. I ran the soundboard. Oh. The music of your life, 14:30 a.m. And the music coming off satellite, and I'd have to play the commercials. I need the Wu Ginsburg. Who was kind of like the Wolfman Jack of Boston? He was Wolfman like a legend. Jack. Yeah. I need the Wu. Uh, and. So I ran that, and then in the morning... Did he put you on air at all? I got to do, like, the weather uh-huh. and sports at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning. That's how my father started. For all seven people listening. Yeah. You had to, like, wrap your head in tinfoil and stick it in a microwave so you could pick up the, uh, the reception. <laughs> my father would listen. And um, so uh, I'd have to open the door for Maddie Siegel's guests. So I met a bunch of cool people, you know? Yeah. And then one of the guys coming in, Dick Doherty. Yeah, he's gonna be on Maddie's show, and Dick, you know, had battled it for the '70s and '80s. You know, he was, you know, a Dick Doherty was a guy who went back when comedy was in different forms, but in the '60s, Dick had a legitimate band that actually did pretty well in New England. Dick Doherty and the Majority. Yeah. Oh, is that what it was? They, uh, I've read uh, reviews from him. The Chicago Tribune called Dick Doherty the Singing Don Rickles. No kidding. That's how they referred to him. Wow. He was he, he he was huge, and um, he had he talked like this, and, and he was he a was, biker. He was a bi- He had a Harley, and he wore a leather vest, and he had a long gray ponytail, and he uh, he basically did the musical, did the band, and then he got into like happy hour comedy. Like became a big happy hour guy. Cap Cape Cod in the summers, and and he was a guy. He he'd have the guitar, and he would sing those songs like. Uh, you lean her up against the wall and have a ba- gang bang. Da da da. Remember those songs? He'd do it, uh, and, and the whole crowd would just sing the rest of the They'd song. They'd sing the rest He'd of the song. He'd just do the guitar thing. Yeah. There were guys like him, Jim Plunkett. Uh, there's a whole slew, and they did a, a documentary about them called The Kings of Cape Cod. No shit. Yeah, it came out a few years ago. It's, wow. pretty, it's pretty good. And some great footage. And But my parents used to go see Dick all the time when they were, you know, first dating and married. Uh-huh. And he had a place called The Mad Russian. Uh, unfortunately, I think he turned out to be the best customer, you know, at the place. And so, and but he battled it, and then he became clean and sober. Yeah. And starts opening up comedy clubs. Mm-hmm. So I introduced myself to him. I opened the door for him, and he's coming into Maddie's show. And I, I said, My parents love you, and he used to go see him. He said, I'm opening a new club. It was a ship. It was a boat next to the uh, Children's Museum here mm-hmm. in Boston, right up the street. Yeah. And it was called Light Ships. And it was like a restaurant. It had, like, pub food on the bottom. And then more, better dining up on the top. People used to moor their boats right there. It was in the channel of the, of the harbor. And he said, how would you like to work in my club? Just like that? Yeah. And I said, 
It wasn't a great... It, the, the interview process was akin to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. <laughs> This is your graduate degree. Yeah. This is, this so, is your master's. So I would have worked there for free. Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I worked seven nights a week. He had shows seven nights a week. It was actually a cool little room, if you it recall. It was a fun room, yeah. It was 100 course. seats, and the, you know, the water is the backdrop. Um, so he used to, I used to, there's no debit or credit cards then. Everybody pays in cash. Mm -hmm. So I used to take the money and then seat the people. And then eventually, a couple weeks in, he says, calls me up. He says, how would you like to... Uh, Bring up the first comic tonight, and then go up a, between the second and third comic and talk about the dinner and show package. <laughs> <laughs> so I, could, I couldn't believe it. It was like in show business, right? I went out and bought a suit. I went out and bought a, 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 a jacket, black pants, and I bought a shirt and a tie that came in the same package. <laughs> I couldn't wait. From Feline's basement? <laughs> it was like, it was yeah. like, uh, it was Marshall's. Marshall's back in the day was yeah. not the Marshall's we know today. No, Marshall's was defective clothing. Ma Marshall's, Don Gavin said, you go to Marshall's, and even the mannequins are irregular. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a joke about Marshall's where, like, I bought this, I bought this suit, and one arm was longer than the other, long, one leg was longer than the other leg, and I put it on, and the, and the, the salesman at the store goes, well, you go like this. Put your shoulder up like that. And I was like, oh, perfect. All right, now just put your hip over to this, this like that. Legs line up perfect. I'm walking down the street like that. And I overhear some lady go, that poor guy. <laughs> and the husband goes, yeah, but look how well his suit fits. <laughs> Marshalls. <laughs> so so I, I, my parents come. My parents are so excited they come. Uh, three sets of my aunts and uncles come to the show. There's like eight people in the crowd. Yeah. So I, I you mean total? No, no, eight people. Oh, okay, yeah. The place is jammed. Yeah. It's Saturday night, so they're in the crowd, and I get. I'm finally. I delay starting the show. Tim, I'm so nervous, and I get up on stage, and I, I like grab the back curtain. I went, <laughs> "How's everybody doing tonight?" <laughs> Hold on, my face is beat red, <laughs> and I hear from the crowd. Isn't he adorable? <laughs> it was my Aunt Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hear another guy, honest to God, say, Isn't that the kid who just sat us? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, so he had me start hosting the shows. And like, well, I'm not doing any jokes, obviously. But, yeah. so, but I was also in charge. The form of payment there, except for, for the, all the days of the week, except for on the weekends, was uh, Dick Bucks. Dick Bucks. They came in $3 increments, mm -hmm. and it had a picture of Dick in the middle, and it said, The Legend, <laughs> under it. And uh, <laughs> more on that in a second. On the, this thing, I recall the whole thing. It came in $3 increments, so the headliners would get 15 Dick Bucks, so five Dick Bucks. The uh, features would get three Dick Bucks, so nine. And then the openers would get three. We get one, one, yeah. one dick buck. Three dollars. Three dollars. Hey, for the yeah. night. Yeah. So, so you got to spend that on food and drink at the establishment. Mm -hmm. And so. And you were allowed to go upstairs with your dick. Well, bucks. not originally. Uh, okay. <laughs> that wasn't discovered until. Yeah. So you know, I'd, I'd say, well, okay, where's, where's Fitz? Oh, he's over there having a hamburger and a coke or whatever. And okay, five minutes. We're gonna start the show. Okay, great. So we're open for a couple of months, and then I said, well, where's, where's, uh, where's, where's Chance Langton? Uh, oh, he's upstairs. <laughs> like upstairs. That's like it's like upstairs. A bunch of comedians like with lobster bibs, <laughs> they having caviar. <laughs> lobster. They're around boater yachters. These guys have yachts and they're <laughs> boats. <laughs> they're they're, and they're getting the dick bucks. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> they, someone counterfeited the dick bucks. <laughs> Because they were black and white. He put them in a mimeograph machine. <laughs> Seven months later, the, the club closed. <laughs> The whole restaurant closed. The comedians <laughs> literally and figuratively sank the ship. Oh, <laughs> sank the comedy. Amazing. I remember that. I remember going there on Sunday because they had a brunch on Sundays. So we would work on Saturday nights. And yep. I don't I don't remember photo photocopying because I worked there so much that I had like a wallet full of dick bucks. And I remember going there on Sundays for brunch, and it would be like Chris Zito and his wife. Yep. Who's now married to Oliver Keithley's old wife? That's right, uh, Li Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yep. Yeah, she's yep. great. Yeah, she's terrific. So, um, so it was a bunch of comics, and yeah, we were champagne and you know crab rolls and lobster rolls, and 
you know, we hang out there all day. It was it was unbelievable. And then I remember the boat went down. The place shut down. So yeah. I call him. I'm working. With, I'm doing an internship at the state house, and I'm kind of devastated because I was. This was awesome. I was there seven nights a week, and I'm meeting all these people, and yeah. just like in these people, I had no idea who they were going to be, but it was just it was pretty cool. But people would drop in, like DePaulo would stop in, and yeah. people who had left in the late '80s and j- drop back in, and it was just it was fantastic. I loved every second. I mean, it was a jump ball whether your car was going to be out there mm-hmm. um, at the end of your shift. Yeah, right. It was it was pretty hairy uh, down here. Who were the people that you saw? I'll ask you two questions. Who were the people that you saw and you said, wow, this guy he's or this woman, which is not many cases in Boston, very, very few women comedians have come out of Boston. It's weird. I don't know why, because yeah. you and I were talking about Sue McGinnis last night, who was one of the killers. She was great. She was terrific. Maria Falzone killed. She was awesome. Julie Barr. Julie Barr was great. Julie Barr came out and did a set at a theater one time dressed as a Viking. She did. She and, was like six and, foot two and, and blonde. And never addressed why she was dressed as a Viking. That's perfect. Just did her set dressed as a Viking. I love it. Didn't, yeah. didn't say, mention one bit of it. Yep. You know? Sue Costello was really strong. Mm-hmm. And so, you, so they never somehow amounted to anything. Well, Sue went on to have a sitcom, but... Well, Wendy Liebman left, had left in, yeah. in fame at Paula Poundstone, but they, those were before, you know... Before the 90s. Right, before. right, right, right. Comedy started to take a little bit of a down. It started to go, I mean, the boom had been in the 80s. Right. Like, if you, had a, if you had a coffee table in a living room and seven seats, you had a comedy club. Yeah. Everybody started doing comedy. Well, and it, Dick's whole MO was he found Chinese restaurants, and he realized that Chinese restaurants all had banquet rooms in the back mm-hmm. that were unused yes. during the week. Right. And so he came in and he would say to the owner, he'd be like, here's the deal. I'm going to do stand-up comedy in a room on a Tuesday night or a Monday night or a Wednesday night. And I'm going to keep all the ticket prices and you're going to have 200 people eating food and drinking. And you keep all of that. And they, of course, are like, fantastic. Yep. And Dick would come in and he'd buy a microphone and a stand, a couple of speakers I don't even think there was lighting systems, right? Was there a spotlight no. even at these clubs? When I worked at all his clubs, I'd have to set up the speakers and the, everything would be in our cars. Oh, they didn't even leave them there. We didn't even leave them there. Oh, no kidding. You take them and set them, set them up every night. You have to set up the speakers. So you're in Manchester, New Hampshire one night. and All the time. Yeah. Just lugging the stuff around. And, it was and just... so Dick would be charged. And what were they getting for tickets at that point? 15 bucks a ticket? I remember the Aku Aku in Worcester. Which was twelve bucks, but on special occasions it was fifteen. All right, so crunch the numbers. Twelve people, average of two hundred people in the crowd. Oh god, yeah. So you're talking about twenty five hundred bucks cash. cash, no credit cards, no register, just here's money <laughs> in your pocket. Twenty five hundred. The headliner would get maybe a buck fifty if they were a big name. Yep. Feature act got seventy five, opener got twenty five. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about less than four hundred four hundred dollars in And the pay. way Dick did things, sometimes the opener got paid nothing. You had a, and you had a for stage time you had to go and help seat people. Yeah. Right. Which I fu- I thought was just so when I caught on to that like two weeks afterwards, I said, I'm not making these guys seat people and then go up and try and make them that's yeah. it just seemed like Undignified. When I worked the, his vault, he had a club that was in an abandoned bank yeah. basement called great the Comedy room. Vault. It was a great little room. Remington's. And I used to have to stack chairs. I would I would perform for free, and then I would stack chairs at the end of the night and sweep the floor. And uh, so basically, twenty five hundred in cash, if not more, three thousand in cash, paying out four hundred, and paying you. What were you making a night? Fifty bucks. Oh, I was making about uh, six fifty an hour, I think, at Light Ships. I eventually, that's a great story about Dick. I was making like seven fifty an hour. Yeah. And I was trucking up to Andover Thursday, Friday, and Saturday <laughs> night. No gas money, right? No gas. I forget about it. And then you have to, in middle rush hour on Thursdays, it took me three hours to get up there. And then sometimes he had me pick up at like an open micer, mm-hmm. and they'd re- you know, recite their act to me. Like, what do you think of this one? And I'm like, I wanted to drive into an embankment, right? I had like a headache. And so... So I, I'm dating this girl at the time, and I have to, you know, you're dating girls at the time, and then you, you have to leave, like, their barbecues at, like, yeah. 6 o'clock. People are like, where are you going? Well, John works. Where do you work? <laughs> work at a, like I'm a surgeon, right? <laughs> work at a comedy club, right? What do you do? And I said, oh, I manage it. And Oh, that's great. You should, you should have an Uncle Frank there. <laughs> I said, 
Your Uncle Frank? Yeah, he was. he's not here today, but at 4th of July, he had us rolling. <laughs> You should you should put him up on stage. He's he's a riot. Yeah, we're but. looking. Actually, we're looking for <laughs> comics right now. We got an ad in the paper. I used to tell people, yeah, you should have Uncle Frank show up to Nick's Comedy Stop when people have been drinking scorpion bowls for the last 10 hours and see how fun, funny Uncle Frank is. He'll be in the fetal position. <laughs> like, <laughs> Suddenly, Frank's the least drunk guy in the room <laughs> instead of the most drunk guy in the room. So I finally, I'm dating this girl, and I said, I'm, I'm, I've had it. I'm, I'm getting to, I, I want to go for, I'm going to go for a raise. It was seven, I was giving a 7.15 hour we decided nine bucks an hour. I'm gonna ask for nine bucks an hour. I'm gonna, cause he call in every night. How are we looking? And I give him the numbers, and it just you know. And then I drop off the money on Saturday nights to his to his safe, like six, seven, eight thousand dollars in cash to his safe. And I'm like, come on, give you know, take care of the kid. You yeah, know? yeah. So I'll never forget it. He calls in for the numbers, and he says, uh, "All right, Joe, we'll have a good weekend." And I said, "I, I it, it, Dick, Dick," and he says. All right, hey, John, I, I can tell from the beginning of the conversation there's something you want to talk about. <laughs> Spit it out. What is it? And I'm like, well, I, I want to... Now all my bravado from the barbecue is over now, and I'm, I'm my, my rehearsals. I said, I was thinking about... A, thinking about you. Spit it out. Thinking about a what? I said, I'm <laughs> thinking about a race. He goes, a race. <laughs> race. Well, John, how much were you thinking? Here's my big chance. I went, I was thinking like, uh, you know, like $8. <laughs> he talked me out of a buck without even, yeah. you know what I mean? He says, this is what he says. He says, well, John, I'll take it under advisement. <laughs> he, says, <laughs> he says, but let me leave you with this. As I grow, you'll grow. <laughs> You just dropped off a bag with six grand and made 40 for the night and did everything. And I got my 50 cent raise about seven months later oh. after a review by the HR team at uh, Dick Darby Enterprises. <laughs> he focus grouped it. <laughs> right. Workshopped it. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's amazing. He did my parents' my parents' 25th wedding anniversary. They went to Bermuda uh -huh. and they came back to the house. I had a surprise party with like 75, 80 people there. Yeah. Some of their close friends and family and stuff. So... He, he did roasted my parents in front of the in front of the. They're sitting in front of a fireplace. My did they know there. that was coming? It was they had no idea. They yeah. had no idea anybody's gonna be. There was a surprise. They walk yeah. in with their luggage. And right. There's all these people at their house, and Dick Doherty's there, and his motorcycle's parked out front. He was, uh -huh. with, you know, and so he's roasting me. It was it was actually pretty funny. But then he starts going on the crowd, including one of my aunts who had twelve kids, and some most of them were there, and they were all big people. Yeah. And he says, 12 kids, huh? I could tell you were a potty girl when I saw the rope burns on your wrists. <laughs> Two of my cousins had to be restrained <laughs> from tackling him into the, into the, ch to the tr chimney. <laughs> and he says to me, my father was 10 years older than my, my mother. He goes, oh, geez. He goes, your age, you'd be happy just to get a stiff neck. <laughs> of course, I'm dying. <laughs> And thing, but there were four or five people who went to their grave barely talking to me again. That's you know, they great. like they stayed clear of me. It was of dirty not, dick dark. Because dirty, it was not the same. Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. I remember, like, I mean, look, it got may he rest in peace. Dick just died about a year ago. He gave me my start, he gave me my start too. I mean, he was a guy who he really got. People. He understood psychology. Oh, like, sure he did. Just the way he handled that negotiation. Like, he knew how to play everybody. But he also, you know, got me on stage as an opener before anybody else. I was a feature act, because if you're an opener, you do like, you know, 10, 12 minutes. And then the feature act does 20, 25. And then the headliner has to do 45. And so before I had 25 minutes, he was booking me as a feature. But the, the caveat was, Everybody else paid you, you know, 75 to feature. Dick was paying you MC money to feature. Right. And then when you headlined, he gave you feature money. But it was a chance to see if you could do that much time. And it was a chance to get used to being a feature act. And so I remember Chris McGuire, who was a great comic, who ended up going into writing. And he's writes... Uh, Head writer for all the Comedy Central roasts. He was one of my favorites. Written on here. a million shows. Great, great dude. 
So anyway, uh, Chris is in bed one morning, and you know comics, we're out all night, sleep, sleep till noon. <laughs> he gets a call at like 7.30 in the morning, fumbles for the phone, and he picks it up, and he's like, hello? And it's Dick Darty, and he goes, are you ready to headline? <laughs> Chris is like, I got, I got 30 minutes. He's like, yep, I got it, Dick. And he started headlining him. And it was the same with me. He headlined me before anybody else, and uh, and he and he paid. He was there was some guys in town. Billy Downs was a guy that didn't pay you, or he he owed everybody mm -hmm. a lot of money, and and so Dick at least was a stand-up guy and paid you. Yeah, no, uh, he was. Uh, he you mentioned he died. I went to his I went to his uh, funeral. Uh, and uh, even in death, just uh, a bad booking. Uh, Saturday at 1 o'clock on Labor Day weekend. Was, <laughs> was it? <laughs> <laughs> this is convenient. Yeah. And he had passed away like four months earlier. So they scheduled for, but it was, it was very nice. And it turned into like a roast, you know. Uh -huh. and, and, but Zito, Zito spoke. He was terrific. Yeah. Uh, Corey Rodriguez, some, of the bo some people who worked for him and stuff. So it was nice. And then out on the front doorstep, I, I'm with Mike Donovan. And I said, Mike, I started talking about the dick bucks. And Mike Donovan says, you remember those? I said, yeah, I was in charge of them. And he said, uh, you want one? I said, what? And he says, I have a few at home. I said, you have original dick bucks? He says, yeah, I'll send you one. I said, OK. <laughs> a month goes by. I don't even think about it anymore. I get an envelope in the mail just addressed to me, nothing else inside but the dick buck <laughs> and the thing. And I treasure it. That's it amazing. might as well be a thousand dollar bill. That's amazing. I love. It. I'm gonna put it in a frame. Donovan is such a character that this it, only he would have still had the dick buck. He is, he's an archivist. He has rights file cabinets in his apartment. He has VHS tapes stacked with Boston Red Sox clips, and he's a baseball card collector. Yep. So, I was driving him down. Here's the thing. Uh, the other thing that would get you work in Boston was. If you had a functional car and a driver's license, there was so many headliners like Teddy who had lost their licenses the DUIs, yeah. from DUIs. They were all drunks, they were all cokeheads, and they couldn't get to gigs. And so if you could drive the headliner, you got the gig. So, and Mike Donovan was not a drunk, but for whatever reason, he did not have a car. He, right. was, he was just such a, like, you know, uh, intellectual, whatever he, so he didn't have a car. So. I had to drive him from Boston to Providence every night, which is about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And I would pick him up. We lived near each other. I'd pick him up, and we would drive down. And Mike is a very intense, quiet guy. Yep. And I so Mike, what have you been up to? Nothing. A couple conversations started, and then I finally just go, all right, I guess we're just going to drive. So we're driving down, not talking, do the show, drive back, not talking. Three nights, back and forth, not a word. And at the end of it, he goes, uh, and then, you know, at the end, usually the headliner will throw you a couple bucks for gas. And instead he goes, uh, why don't you come to my apartment? And he was a big pothead, so I was like, I guess he's going to get me stoned instead of giving me gas money or something. So we go into his apartment, and he sits me in the living room, and he goes into his bedroom. And he's gone for like 15 minutes. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And so finally he comes out, and he's got a stack <laughs> of... Um, laminated baseball cards, you know, sheets, yep. sheets of baseball cards. I don't know shit about baseball. And so I'm looking at these players. I don't know who the hell they are. They're all rookie cards. Right. They're all like, they're not worth anything. And so he gives me all these baseball. I'm like, I could he could he use gas money? But I was like, thanks, Mike. So I go home. They're sitting in my bedroom. And then I, 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 I put them in my aunt's trunk in the Bronx for 20 years. I don't look at them for 20 years. And then I was recently back. And my aunt died, so we're going through the basement. And I find this stack of baseball cards. And I look at it, and half of them, so about 50 cards, Mark McGuire rookie cards. <laughs> and I go, this is crazy. This is a gold mine. You just hit the lottery. And you I just hit the lottery. Yep. And so I rush off to the hobby store in my neighborhood where they, they buy cards. And I say to the guy, I go, I got a, I got a good situation for me and you. I got a little something here, and I pull out the the Mark McGuire rookie cards, and I go, "What do you give me for a card?" He goes, uh, 
He goes, uh, if, you brought me, if you brought me these before the doping scandal, he goes, about $250 a card. Yep. He goes, now, five cents. You had to pay him to get rid of yeah, them. Yeah. He wouldn't take them. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think Mike Donovan, out of that group, he's one of the originals. I think he's the most underrated of them all. I think he's the most underrated I agree. of them all. I, I think agree. He's, he's just, and, you know, a lot of his act back in the day was prophetic. Talking about, like, and that stolen base, that stolen base brought to you by Exxon. You know, Exxon helps you keep on moving. Yeah. He was doing that in the 70s and 80s. And right. now that's standard in baseball. Like, everything is sponsored. Every pitch yeah. is sponsored. Every foul ball is sponsored. Every hit by a pitch is sponsored. Everything is sponsored. Right. He was, like, like, a prophet about that stuff. Yeah. Um, you would ask me at the beginning about, you know, a couple of guys, people that I knew and people I didn't know. Uh, yeah, that, when, that I when they started, on. who were the people that you saw that you said? Dane, Dane Cook. Dane Cook. I didn't know anything about anything, but I just saw Dane Cook just was, he would light a place on fire. Mm -hmm. He'd just light a club on fire. He'd go out in the audience like a dinosaur across the mm -hmm. tables. And, and people, he, he used to do like three or four shows in Boston, then call me up in Andover and say, you got a spot for me? Mm -hmm. It's a Thursday night bringer show, like companies, like free tickets and everything. And I'd say, yeah, and i put them on. People started paying money to come see Dane Cook mm -hmm. to see because they knew he was going to be closing up the shows. Yeah. Um, he, he just had a work ethic and that I just thought. He, and, you know, I know that's been kind of the rub against Dane. He, he didn't hang out with the comics afterwards, and I know that he probably just, he was probably inventing MySpace or whatever he was doing. God knows what he was doing, right? Well, but, I, I do remember, like, Nick's Comedy Stop, their open mic night was on Sunday nights, I think. Sunday or Monday. Uh, Sunday or Monday. Is that the one Noxy uh, headlined? No, Billy, Bill, Billy Martin. Oh, used, Billy well, Martin. Billy Martin used to host it. Billy Martin, another, another one of my favorites. Great writer. Smart. Such a good writer. He's now the Bill head Mars. writer for Bill Maher. Yeah. He has been for a lot of years. But Pitts Pittsburgh, right? He's from Pittsburgh originally, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, he used to talk about the, uh, the Detroit. They, Detroit used to wave something in the crowd in the, at the sports games, and he goes... Oh, the octopus at the Red Wings games. During yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, and then in Detroit... They have uh, the Detroit. They wave panties, the piston panties. <laughs> he used to do this alliteration stuff. I I worked in the state house um, for this woman. She was like she was in her seventies, Barbara Gray, and she asked me to put on a comedy fundraiser for her. She was having a br a, a brunch. This is nineteen ninety two, ninety three. She's having this brunch at the Tara Hotel in Framingham, the Sheridan Tara Hotel. Mm -hmm. It's from. It's from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and she wants comedy as part of this. So I hire Billy. I think the money was like 200 bucks. It's like my first gig I've ever booked, right? Mm -hmm. So I booked Billy Martin because he's one of my favorites. And, um, and as luck, he's appearing on Sunday. As luck would have it, he ends up on Leno. So it must have been 93. He ends up on Leno on Thursday night. And I'm like, oh, this is so exciting, right? I'm going to introduce him. He just was on the Leno show, and he goes up there and dies... The death of all deaths. There's people there. There's, oh, it's an older crowd. They're yeah. all in suits and ties, and like yeah. they're. And to his credit, afterwards, like he's out there shaking hands with people as they're walking out, and I'm standing next to him. One guy comes up to me, and says, "You call those jokes? I never heard of any of those jokes before. Uh, Where'd you come up with that stuff?" Yeah, yeah. And then, and then another <laughs> another guy says, uh, "You're gonna be good, but you gotta work on your timing. Your timing's <laughs> all off." And I'm like, "Wow, this is a this is a tough business." Uh, but the one I, I was wrong about was uh, was Rogan, and that was even before I started in the clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I dated this uh, this girl, and she worked at the Newport Creamery in Newton with her sister, and they worked with this guy Joe. And so I'd go pick them up after work if they're working together, drive home, watch TV with them or whatever. And and then one night I said, she got in the car. My girlfriend got in the car, and I said, "Where's Catherine?" Oh, she's, uh, Joe, Joe's taking her home. I said, what, what? And she had a boyfriend. I said, what? She said, oh, Joe wants to be a comedian. He makes uh, tapes and makes her listen to him in the car. And I'm like, oh, wow, what a winner. You know, and <laughs> so then, like a week later, my girlfriend calls me up. It's a Monday afternoon. She said, do you want to go to Nick's Comedy Stop tonight? And I used to go to Nick's all the time. That's the first time, first place I ever went to saw a live comedy, 1986. Mm -hmm. It was... Kevin Knox, DJ Hazard, 
Don Gavin and Sweeney coming off the street to do a, a, a spot at the end. I'd never seen anything like it before in my entire life. I was just, it was, it was unbelievable. So I said, she said, it's open mic night and Joe's going to be on, on stage. I said, oh, we got to go see this. <laughs> she said, we'll come pick you up. He's going in with his family. I said, all right. So we go in, there's 75 people there. He goes up and he's terrible. Just, I mean, brutal. Yeah. So he comes home with us. They drop me off in West Roxbury and, and he's in the backseat with me. He says, how do you think I did? I said, oh, you're going to be a star. <laughs> I'm being a complete <laughs> asshole, right? I, you're going to be a, your name's going to be Lights. It's going to be amazing. You're a star. It's going to be great. You're going to get $100 million from a streaming service someday. Four years later, three or four years later, end up working for Dick Doherty, making $6 an hour. I can't even afford cheeseburgers, right? Even the Dick Bucks aren't covering it. And uh, Joe Rogan walks in fresh off his, his $300,000 holding deal at Disney. Yeah. And I, it, it, I since have, profu- have ap- apologized to him profusely every time I see him, <laughs> and uh, but it, but him and I did the same thing with Burr too. Um, it taught me a great. It's, it's something when I when young comics when I talk to them all the time, and I'm I'm not a comedian, but I've been around it enough. Just I, I always tell them I said the Chappelle's, the Eddie Murphys, the Pete Davidsons, they're shooting stars. Those are like they're like comets. Because it takes ten years to be doing this to find your voice and who you are and and your life experience, and talk about that. and um, So it taught me a great lesson to, even when I see an open mic today as someone who, may, I, I withhold the judgment. Just because. Well, yeah, because like I remember Burr, when Bill Burr started, <laughs> and he started a few years after me, and he was just this sweet, red-headed, fresh-faced young kid. He looked like he was about 15 years old. He looked like Ronald McDonald. Yeah, he did. He did. And he did not have the swagger and the attitude back then that no. he had today. And did, what was your take on him when you first saw him? He did this joke about it. He says, yeah, I got a, I got a brother named, uh, my name's uh, Bill Burr. I got a brother named uh, Tim. When my, uh, my mother calls us for dinner, she goes, Tim Burr! <laughs> Stand in the back just cringing. Like, <laughs> and there he's 30 years later selling out Fenway Park. <laughs> He should have done the timber joke. <laughs> Do you know, uh, I ran into a guy, uh, Bill, that, that was a Sunday night at Fenway Park. He, ran, he did, we run Nick's Comedy Stop now, and uh, that was the first place he ever appeared on stage. So on Friday, before that Sunday concert, he ran through his 90-minute set at Nick's Comedy Stop. Oh, wow. In front of 100 people. No kidding. It was... Unreal. Wow. Amazing. Hit his, do- his film crew with them. But uh-huh. we, gave, we gave him, we found on eBay a couple years ago an original uh, shirt the waitresses used to w- uh, wear at Nick's. And we put it in a frame for him and had like a thing, an inscription on the bottom and stuff. And he seemed to be genuinely touched by it. Uh-huh. Uh, and, but he sat with Tony V at the bar at Nick's in the afternoon with the film crew. And he and Tony just sat there for an hour and talked about Boston comedy and the old days of Boston comedy. It was like pornography. That's it was amazing. it was like the most amazing thing. Yeah, I had ever sat and listened to. Right, I could have listened for hours. I think they could have talked for hours too. Talk about the night that Bill was. He was in town and he had an off night, and he called you to see in this room to see if he'd come down and do a set. Yeah, he called me. Was and that we, a few years ago? It was a couple of years ago. He's been in a couple of times, and uh, and and one time he kind of he helped change my life a little bit, but in a, another way, but. There was a, a guy, uh, Mr. D, in, and, and, and he's a former school teacher, and he's gay. And, um, he, but his whole crowd is 300 school teachers um, between the ages of 22 and 30. And it's, it was, it's 250 women and 50 gay guys. That was, that's the crowd for mm-hmm. him, right? And yeah. they go crazy over him. So... Bill said, like, you know, he wanted to do, he's going to do his own show the next night, but he wanted to, you know, be up on stage. He wanted to do 20 minutes. So it doesn't matter who it is, out of respect to the headliner, you always ask. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, there's not a chance that Bill Burr wasn't going to get on the stage, but out of, so I went in the green room. I said, Joe, do you mind? He says, oh, my God. He says, he said, Bill Burr's my favorite comedian. He says, but this isn't his crowd. Yeah. And I said, he just wants to do the 20 minutes. So he's walking. I said, it's a bunch of school teachers. He says, oh, great. And 
he gets up on stage. He gets up on stage, and first of all, it was, it was amazing to me. It just we're getting older. I mean, Bill's fifty-four. Uh, a third of the crowd didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. A third maybe knew who he was, and the other third was like, "What the hell is he doing yeah, here?" Yeah, yeah. Like, what is? But there was a couple, like five or six people, like they were elated, right? It was. But I would have, I would have had sweat rolling down my back. It was just not going well. Well, this and is at the point where he's doing the whole bit about how they say being a mother is the hardest job in the world. He's oh, like, yeah. "Oh yeah, you got to pop in a DVD of Aladdin and set up a sippy cup." <laughs> He says, I think being a white Irish Catholic roofer from Boston in the summertime is a little bit tougher. <laughs> so they were not digging it. Yeah. They, and, uh, and then he says, okay. He says, you know, it may not seem like it. I'm having a great time. I can't speak for the rest of you. I have a pretty good idea. But we go on, and he starts going on to the material. And, and he doesn't he back off the material. Doesn't back off the material. Yeah. He just stands right here. He doesn't back up. He just stands right here. And then he finally says, you know, the problem is, <laughs> the problem is all of you. <laughs> it's all of you. Anybody, anytime someone's offended, the gays, the bi's, the trans, the, you know, it, he, he says, and you're, he says, I'm sitting in the same whirlpools with you at the resorts. <laughs> he says, you got nothing to worry about. He says, but you have to be offended for somebody. Yeah, yeah. And you have to put your pointy toe Gucci boot over the fence and stand there and say, I'm offended for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he gets in the green room. He says, wow. He says, I haven't bombed like that in years. And he said, it feels good, though. He says, it feels good. <laughs> you got to touch the bottom sometimes. It, it's so true as a comic. Your growth, I mean, it's like anything in life. Growth comes from failure. It's when you take stock of what you're doing. It's when you your creative juices kick up because you know, not that that was going to end his career, but it brings up the moments that you really used to think it was going to end your career. Sure. You know, when you used to bomb early on, you thought, I shouldn't be doing this. You question it. And when you bomb again, the juices flow, and you will. You should have bought a ticket for the next night because that's the night you kill. The night after a bomb, you annihilate. The, the next night, the roof came off this place for him, and he just lit it up. Yeah. I mean, he put it into another gear. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes you see a hockey player, yeah. and they just put it into another gear, right. like a forward. And yeah. like, how did, they're out there against the best in the world, and how do yeah. they do that? Yeah. And he just did that, and it just, yeah, he used the night before as fuel. Yeah. How would you compare that to my set last night? I, honest to God, I'm not... First of all, this is a huge honor to be on this, this oh, show. Oh, of course. I, I, I feel like I'm inside my phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, honest to God, I, you have been one of my favorites. I mean, Don Gavin is my favorite yeah. of all time, but you were always like one of my favorites to watch. I wouldn't miss your sets and stuff. And I, every time you're here, every time I go, I go see your sets, because I leaned over, and Tommy Mack comes in with me, and it's like a... You know, a couple other people wanted to come in last night, but I always, I, I think to myself, wow, this is how I remember watching comedy shows in like 1996, not that your, mater your material is not, it's all up to date and current yeah. and everything, but it's just like, it's just like the, and the crowd work, the thing with the guy with the cat, yeah. you, the guy sitting there, I, <laughs> you say, you by yourself, sir? No, I was with my friend. Where is he, in the bathroom? No, he had to go home. Why? <laughs> His cat's sick. You go, what did he, the cat call him? <laughs> <laughs> then these two kids over here, both undecided about schools. <laughs> right? And you challenge him about where his school, what town his school's in. <laughs> so, like, to me, that's just like, uh, that's how I, I, I just love, I'm, listen, I've seen a million comedy shows, and by this point, it's like, I can barely sit through them. Right. But when there's people who I really love and admire and watch on stage, I, and, you know, I'm not going to miss it. No, that's and nice be, to I'm hear. I'm going to be up for both of them you. tonight, too. I got to tell you, the, the Boston crowds is where I started. And you get to know that I said it last night. Usually there's a line that you don't want to cross. And in Boston, that line, the crowd is just going, yeah, keep coming, kids. You're not even close. Like, you can say anything. There was a woman I said, has anybody saved a life? And she goes, I did. I said, what happened? She said, a kid was choking, and I gave him the Heimlich maneuver. I said, 
what was he choking on? And she goes, a cucumber. <laughs> I go, a cucumber? You ever think it was just a gay kid practicing? <laughs> and fucking everybody laughs. They all and, and, you know, you do that joke at like a certain room in L.A., that show over. That's it. They oh, just you'll get, shut down. You'll get tased. They, and, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. They the don't stage. laugh anymore. But well, Boston I think that's Crabs why it's a so to, You know, I was in politics for years, and I, even though I've never been a comic, um, there's a lot of I, I, there's a lot of analogies between it. I think, first of all, you go. I go out and knock doors. I've knocked thousands of doors in my lifetime. You know, strangers, and someone opens the door enough. To, over the argument they have with their spouse, or having the kid in the tub, and or taking a nap, they work the night shift. They come to the door. You've got nine seconds to make an impression on them. Yeah. That's all you got. Yeah. You got. It's the first nine seconds. I think it's a lot that way with comedy. People kind of make mm -hmm. up their mind. Yeah. At the beginning, mm -hmm. sometimes rightly or wrongly, but they make that first impression. Uh, but it's a lot of. But there's a lot of. And then you know, someone slams the door in your face. I it think it's probably a, it's probably tantamount to bombing, doing yeah. a five-minute set and bombing. And then you got to it. just pull makes it you want to pull it up and, okay, I'm going to get the next door. I'm going right. to get a good, and I get a good response the next door. Okay, I'm back. Right, I'm back, right? right? And it's yeah. sort of like, I've learned a lot of lessons from working in the clubs that I've put to practice, uh, that I put to practice in politics, and pretty much in my professional life, too. The way to use humor to diffuse a situation, it can really disarm people. But where did you get the fortitude? Because you just have such thick skin, and, you know, you went into politics, and you were very well suited to that, but also to... You know, the early struggles that you went through and the lessons you learned from that. But you didn't just learn lessons from that. You brought something to those experiences of showing up and not taking no for an answer and believing in yourself. Like, where did that come from? Uh, my parents, uh, my, my father was a tough guy. Yeah. He was a tough guy. He was a construction worker, worked in a liquor store two nights a week. I mean, he, on, I'm not, he, I wouldn't have lasted five minutes on a construction site doing what he mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Built staging, mixed cement. He was a tender he, mm -hmm. for bricklayers, you know? Me, like hard, hard labor, driving a truck, cement, just caked and did cold, wet, you know, in the wintertime get laid off. Yeah. And would take a job driving a limo or right. snow plowing or, you know, as a, sh you know, I just, he did all kinds, he just did what he had to do. Mm -hmm. and my mother was a waitress and she still runs a daycare. She's 73 years old, still runs a home daycare. Wow. And there was just sort of like, but my father was, uh, he was, I, I don't know, I don't know if my father knew what school I went to. Mm -hmm. I don't think he, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like it was sort of like, I have a friend, Mark Shadavoy from Charlestown. He said, he, we were talking about this one time and he said, I was in fourth grade. He said, I was, he said, I was like 10 or 11 years old. And he said, I'm sitting on my, we have no air conditioning and we have an oscillating steel fan on the third floor in Charlestown. He said, my father's smoking a pipe and drinking a Budweiser and reading the Herald. Right, and they're watching the Red Sox game, and just out of the, he says, puts on the paper, he says, Maki, what, uh, what class, what uh, grade are you going to next year?" <laughs> just <laughs> had no idea what grade he was going into. <laughs> and what I love is not a big sense of investment in the question. It's just, it was just a, a conversation starter. It was a passing yeah, thought. Yeah, it's a conversation starter. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Mark said it was a big deal. He got he got asked to his first. He got offered out for his first fight when he was 13 years old. Uh -huh. It's a big deal. Yeah, I offer you out. Yeah, and so he got offered out, and so he said it was on a Saturday, and he said, you know, it's a big event. There's gonna be a hundred people there. No text, no nothing. Right. Everybody seems to find their way there, right? Uh -huh. Make, forms a circle, and he said, he said my father was so excited that he gave me a ride to the fight, <laughs> and I said, did he stay? And he said, no, that would have been weird. <laughs> and I said, what did he say? He says, he says, Mike, get out of the car. And he says, Mikey, throw the first punch. Wow. And drove away. No kidding. And drove away. And, like, you know, but that, that's, those, that's these tough guys, these, this sensibility, like, they just, they didn't take, like, they didn't take any garbage from you. Yeah. It was just sort of like. And what did, what did your father's parents do? Were they immigrants? Yeah, the immigrants from Ireland, yeah. yeah. They met on the way over from Ireland. And, uh, and How old were they when they came over? Oh, they were in their 20s. Uh, my father never really talked about his father too much. My, he died. In my the, father has never told me a word about his parents. Yeah, we did that Ancestry 23, and I'm trying to, I'm putting the pieces together. I'm trying to figure out why, yeah. you know. Um, you know, he, they had seven kids in the family, and mm -hmm. you know, my, my father had a. Everybody worked. You worked when you were ten years old, and 
you didn't keep the money. It went into the family. It paid for food. Yeah. It paid for, you know, it paid for keeping the heat on yeah. and stuff. You know, they lived, they lived hard lives. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, you know, it's my, my father died seven years ago, but, you know, had this beautiful house and family and, you know, cars and stuff like that. There's a, there's a tinge of guilt that comes over you, you know. When my father found out how much I was, well, it was public information when I was on the city council. Yeah. He used to call me uh, Johnny Moneybags. <laughs> he says, your back hurt from your wallet, <laughs> you know. And there was, it wasn't all joking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, wasn't yeah. All, like, right, right. But it was, but he was, you know, he was the guy who was out, he made all my signs. He made all my house signs. Yeah. He was out there the first, at 6.30 in the morning with me in front of Dunkin' Donuts. No he was shaking kidding. hands with people. Wow. Yeah, he was, you know, uh, and I, I lost twice before I won. As uh, city councilman. As city, yeah. I lost so let me twice. ask you this, because there was a lot of talk about this at a certain point. Is that I remember the community's like, yeah, Johnny Tobin, like people want him to run for mayor, and we were all like, I just remembered you taking tickets for Dick Darty, <laughs> and I'm like, what? Because I'd been out of town for a minute, yeah. so I didn't know about all your city council stuff. So, what was that situation, and why didn't you pursue it? Well, I wanted to be mayor in the worst way. When we grew up in Mattapan, there was a guy, Joe Timothy, Mr. Timothy, uh, and he was a state senator, and I hung around with all his kids. The neighborhood in Mattapan, every, the, we had a school committeeman, a congressman, a state representative, a state senator, uh, Mr. Timothy. They were, and so every, I've been holding signs for people since I was five uh-huh. and dropping literature for people. And every other year there was an election or, and there was always someone running against them from the neighborhood. So it was always a brawl in the neighborhood. I just yeah. loved it, you know? Yeah. And so Mr. Timothy ran for mayor a few times in the 70s and came in second uh, three times. Wow. 71, 75, and 79. Tough. And um, this is when busing was going on. Yeah, he he kind of he yeah, he ran against Kevin White. And I, Kevin White was uh, was the mayor of Boston. He was a legend. 16 years of revitalized Faneuil Hall mm-hmm. like a real. We despised Kevin White. We were Timothy people. Yeah. But I mean, the 79 race when we moved to West Roxbury, there'd be on a Saturday morning. This was not a lie. There'd be 500 people out holding signs, 250 for White, 250 for Timothy, just staring each other down for like a mile down. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, it was like, that was in every neighborhood across the city. Yeah. Yeah, but there was some tumultuous times, obviously, during the 70s and busing, and uh, Timothy came within a couple of percentage points of in 75 and knocking him off. And my father was, you know, my father was going to become the Parks Commissioner. He was all, oh, we were all set, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, so I, we moved to West Roxbury, got involved in politics there, and just, and I just wanted to be mayor. I mean, I used to write on my books. People used to write like Aerosmith and Def Leppard and, you know, Led Zeppelin. And I'd write, I'd make my own Tobin for mayor, like bumper stickers and signs. <laughs> it's like, who's the weird kid? What a weird thing to want as a kid's kid. Ni- kids nine, <laughs> making my own Tobin for mayor <laughs> on my books. Like, yeah. I wonder why I didn't have any friends. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, but I ran for, I ran for city council. I, I came in, I came in second the first time in 95. I was 24 years old. And I said, okay. I was at five Wait, people. Wait, you ran from. For, for city council for when city? I was twenty when I was twenty four, wow. and I've worked on a million campaigns, but I'd never been the candidate before, and it was yeah. surreal. I'm out there waving a the traffic, uh-huh. and I can remember I'm waving a traffic one day. I'm like, "What the hell have you got yourself into?" Yeah. And then my first debate against a fourteen year incumbent, uh-huh. I was shaking yeah. under the table. I was ready to pass out, yeah. you know. But then you, you gotta like you gotta do it. Mm-hmm. So she beat me, and. Uh, so I didn't run in 97, the two-year terms, and then I, 99, I got her. This is my year. Mm-hmm. We thought we had it, and she beat me again. I was devastated. 95, yeah. I was fine because I knew I had set a foundation. Yeah. There'd be another day. And then 99 was crushing. Mm-hmm. And then the company I worked for that I had taken a leave from, the private company, they laid me off. The fu- I lost on Tuesday. They oh, laid me off on Thursday. Wow. So I'm, I'm like, and you lose an election, I always say, if you're going to leave, leave office, leave on your own terms. Don't get indicted, but don't, don't lose don't an election. Don't lose an election. Because people are so, to this day, people are so nice to me. Hey, John, how are you? Otherwise, they'd be crossing the street to get away from you. Uh-huh. So it's great to leave on your own terms, which I was able to, I was fortunate enough to be able to do. But uh, 99, that was devastating. That's when McHugh and I started the comedy festival. Uh-huh. And so went out to Los Angeles in, two, in 2001. Uh, to do some scouting, and um, one of the guys I was with, he said, hey, there's a bunch of girls from uh, Dorchester and 
in Boston, Milton, who live out here. They're having a party tonight. We should go to, we had an off night. So we go, and then one of the girls from Milton, that, that's my wife, that's Kate. I, she's from Milton, but she lived in Los Angeles in West Hollywood. So I met, that's where I met her. So we kind of hit it off. And then the, the same time I'm out there, we get notice that the lady that had beat me twice decided to run for another seat and freed up her spot. But it's late. So I fly home, and I get all my people together, and a lot of them told me, don't do it. Mm -hmm. It's too late, there's other kids in the race, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't, I cannot not do this. I ran twice, I came in second to her, and it, what turned, it, it turned out to be, it turned out to be the Civil War of West Roxbury. It, it, me and this kid, who I'm really great friends with now, he's still elected, is a state senator, but we had, we had a Timothy White battle. Really? It was one for the ages. Uh -huh. it, was, it got nasty, and it got really, to the point where you're like, oh my, what do we got? Oh, this is crazy. Wow. He beat me in the preliminary. Thank God they're nonpartisan races. He beat me by 799 votes. We were, I just said, I was, this is it. Yeah. And then uh, six weeks later was the general, no one gives us any chance. We ended up beating him by 1,100 votes in the final. Wow. We turned around almost 2,000 votes. W were you just hustling at that point? This is your political, this is, this is it. Because yeah. otherwise I'd be running a uh, circus in Tallahassee or something, right? I was, I was leaving. If I lost that race, I was, I was leaving the city. Because uh -huh. you just feel, okay, I'm, this is, yeah. I'm, I've been rejected. Three-time loser. Three-time yeah. loser. Right. You know? And so uh, I was very fortunate to pull that one out. He was so gracious about it, even in, you know, the thing, we became really good friends, but, um, uh, but it, you know, then I would get a front row seat in city politics, and Mayor Menino is the mayor, mm -hmm. 20 years as the mayor, yeah. I, his people and personal antenna was off the charts, mm -hmm. he could, he was not very eloquent, if he could speak, he would have been president of the United States, yeah. but his people antenna was off the charts, yeah. he'd say, uh, who are you, he'd call me, call me down to his office, come down here. Are you working on he never asked a question he didn't know the answer to. Uh -huh. What are you working on that thing with? And I say, uh, Craig Fitzsimmons. No good. No good. <laughs> I'm like, no, he's great. He's a great guy. No good. <laughs> Six months later, you turn out to be not good. Or if I was busting your, your balls, he called me up and he'd say, hey, why are you busting Craig Fitzsimmons' balls? Good guy. I'm like, no, he sucks. <laughs> good guy. You go work with him. Six months later, turn out you were a good guy. Really? Great. He just, he had this, and it was just really this kind of thing about people, kind of so, like D Dick Doherty, right? But this, yeah, you know, yeah, in a, in right. a way, and so, so. what about your, and I'm interested to hear this answer because your son is sitting out here, and I don't know how much of this he's ever heard before, but your he's son is all my 17. Oh, you've heard all this stuff before? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you're going to hear it again. So what about the, the, may, the your scope on being a mayor? What, what so I wanted that? to run for mayor. As much as many know is good to me, he wasn't about to tell me what his plans were. And in 2009, so I'm, I'm a district city council, but I'm raising my profile around the city. I'm trying to. I was chair of Arts and Humanities. That got me around the city a lot. Um, it got me into a lot of fundraising circles. I was raising money. I had a good amount of money in the bank. and I was I've gonna... never been in Boston with anybody that is said hello to more than you. It doesn't matter <laughs> if we're at the Oyster House for lunch or a Bruins game. Anywhere you go, Everybody, you know, and you remember everything about everybody. It's really, well, it's really amazing. I tell people all the time, uh, if you're involved in politics and comedy in the city, you're likely to bump into about 90% of the people who live here. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's, it's just been incredible. So I was able to do both. I was booking comedy while I was in the city council, but I was get, gearing up to run for mayor. And then the, the mayor, I started, like, in 2007. Matthew was born in 2006. Danny came in 2007, 15 months later. And so now we got two kids under the age of two. And it's getting hard, you know, and it's sort of, and I'm starting to see the stuff in the city council is starting to become repetitive. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we did that. I can remember when we did that in 2003, and mm -hmm. it's sort of like, it just started to become like Groundhog Day, and it became a little bit, not a, I, was, I wasn't opposed anymore. There was kind of like that. There wasn't that, that, you know. But I, but I still, but if the if thing opened up in 2013, I was, I was preparing to go. But I, 2010, Northeastern came calling. Mm -hmm. And the boys at the time were two and four. And I just wasn't home a lot, you know. Yeah. I, you know, weekends, you'd have to, you have to be at everything. Yeah. 
I take them with me, and it was a great experience for them, I think, and it was a great experience for me, but, you, you know, you're getting your head beat into meetings and stuff like that. And, and then Northeastern offers you what? They offered me vice president of government of uh, city and community engagement, and which was l looking back, I, I've never regretted it for a day. Mm -hmm. It was the right move. In fact, and you're still there today. I'm still there today, Mayor Menino. If in 2013 turns out, it turns out he was really sick. Uh huh. Uh, but if he wasn't sick in 13, he he would have run again for mayor, and he would have won. Yeah. Um, as it turns out, like 13 people ran for mayor. That's the other thing. You can run. And you can win, that's great. But you could also run and lose and put yourself in debt. And yeah. It's not like you lose for mayor. It's There's not a lot of job. It's not like a big job grove opens up in the, yeah. in the backyard, yeah. right? It's tough. Right. At, at an age where you have kids and a mortgage and stuff like that. So I've never regretted it. And I've always, like, on the other side, being mayor of Boston is really, really tough. It's tough. It's a very divided city. It's You really got both sides of the aisle. You got to appease all the universities. You got two hundred fifty thousand students here every year. The hospitals, the universities, the institutions, the neighborhoods, the restaurants, immigration, the immigration, issues. everything. The city's looking for housing now for migrants. Mm -hmm. We've got a huge, you know, I mean, most big cities do, but we've got a huge, you know, they closed down the drug treatment center over in Long Island, and now we've got a, a situation. It's it's a tough situation on on Mass and Cass in Boston. It's very difficult. People are struggling and. You know, it's and then you add in the last three years what everybody's gone through. Yeah. And it's exacerbated everything. And it's exacerbated is people's anger. Yeah. People are angry, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just like, and people have been alone, and their outlet has been the internet and just the, the stuff. I mean, if you go on my social media, I keep it light and fluffy. Yeah, right, right. And someone said, why don't you say something? I'm like, no. Not a chance. No, no. So now you got, just to sum it up, and then I, w I have one final topic I want to ask you about. So now you're running. Laugh Boston, which is the premier comedy club in Boston. I mean, there's not even a close second. It's uh, it's an elegant, beautiful, big room in an unbelievable location. You get major national headliners. Yeah. And then how many other clubs do you got going now? We run, we run, we own, own and run this. We've got Nick's Comedy Stop, yep. which is it's what a, I, just a huge honor to run that. It's been around since I started. Oh, it's, it's one of the first yeah. places I did stand up. It's like Keith Richards. Yeah. Of comedy, you know, right. it will never die. You know? Yeah, um, and then we've got a place out at, at Springfield at the casino at MGM. We've got a place down at Patriot Place. Um, That's down in uh, by the Gillette Stadium. Yep, exactly. Uh, we had a place in Worcester. That place hasn't reopened since COVID, which is unfortunate. And we book a bunch of one nighters and mm -hmm. theaters and stuff in tents. And then we're in Detroit, Louisville, and Plano, Texas. Wow, and a couple of locations going. So it's. While Listen, still working at Northeastern. Yeah, it's been great. But we have a team of people. Northeastern is my priority. Yeah. But we got a team of like 10 people who, are, who work uh, in comedy, thank God, for me. Because I, I remember, you know, when I started off doing this, you know, weekends, I'd be taking credit card numbers over the phone. Yeah. And like, and just, you know, my first comedy club opened up was in 2009. Tom Menino opened it up for us. Uh -huh. It was called Tommy's. It was really? Named, named after Thomas Wignell who was the first known stand-up comic in the country. Oh, interesting. And uh, I remember Dick Darty. I mean, uh, Dick Darty. Uh, Don Gallon, he says, who the, who the fuck is Tommy? I said, well, who's Nick? Well, that's my final topic. I'm glad you brought up Don Gavin because nobody loves and appreciates Don Gavin more than you. And for people that don't know Don Gavin, which is sadly most of the country. It's crazy. He's the guy that when people say, who do you think is the funniest comedian i say don gavin and people look at me like who what but if you've been in if you've been in boston over the last 40 years if not more you will know that this is a guy who goes in night after night and annihilates with original subtle edgy sarcastic comedy that has influenced every comic that's come through here every comic that started in boston has a little bit of Don Gavin in them. Uh -huh. And some have a lot of Don Gavin in them. Some have a lot. And they're, and they're great comics, too. But it's a, it's a tone that, I mean, you watch Lenny Clark, and you're watching some Don Gavin. You watch Tom Cotter. You watch Wendy Liebman. You're seeing Don Gavin, little pieces of him in them. It's like a tribute to him. And, and the stories, it's not just what he does on stage. It's what a character he is off stage. Off stage, if it's... 
if it's if it's he's so funny off stage it's almost almost funnier than on stage and on stage yeah. he's unreal yeah but the off stage stuff is just uh, can I tell a couple quick yeah, stories please. about him we're doing a, a Dedham Community Theater this is years ago and the the uh, the uh, ancient and honorable this is like uh, they're like a, they wear uniforms. Uh -huh. They're not in the military, but they're yeah. like they're they're a charitable organization. They all wear like red and like fit, like almost like the Shriners and they play like okay. the bears and stuff. And yeah, and the guy who owns the theater, you know, was was an ancient honorable. I'm not sure if he still is. The old Senate president used to call them the ancient honorables. Uh, uh, last to war, first to the Budweiser, <laughs> right? So, right? So, <laughs> so uh, they're doing an annual event <laughs> on a Tuesday night at the Denham Community Theater. Tuesday night. So it's like 150 guys, and we're all in their uniform. It's a big night out for them, right? Yeah. So they asked me to put on a comedy show. So I put on Don Gavin, and he wanted Larry Lee Lewis. Ha ha! You ever seen Larry Lewis? Yeah. Larry Lee Lewis was he had a keyboard, and uh, he said, you know, he he he'd tell a joke, these corny jokes, street jokes, or, you know. He say, uh, yeah, I was uh, I was born in Lynn, and then my parents moved us to Chelsea. They didn't raise us; they lowered us. Ha ha! Da 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 da. Right. <laughs> <laughs> die in the background. <laughs> so things like that. So uh, he's bombing. And there's a guy heckling him. There's like an 80-year-old guy heckling uh -huh. Larry Lee Lewis. And so you know how Gav feels about hecklers. Yeah. So Gav gets on the stage. He says, uh, hey, before we get started, hey, uh, old guy, keep your fucking mouth shut. He says, uh, the duration of the show. And uh, he says, I won't be so kind as the previous guy. Yeah. And so the guy says something to him. And Gav says, uh, hey, uh, how about I uh, piss on you from the stage? He says, and don't worry, I can reach. <laughs> right? So it goes on and on, right? So at the end, he says, uh, in closing, let me just say this, sir. You are ancient, but you're not honorable. <laughs> so now they've got strippers coming in on a Tuesday night. Because they're honorable, at, yeah. After the, after the comedians. Yeah. So... I'm an aw so we we me Larry Lewis and Gav. I mean I'm an aw I can't be sticking around for this right. I'm good. So Gav says, uh, you know, let's have a cocktail, and so we go up to the film room, up to you know we have some drinks because any chance you're going to be around Don Gavin, you're going to soak it all in. Yeah. You don't care how long you're going to be there. So as we're going up the stairs, here come like three big guys and like five ladies strippers. Uh huh. It was not the uh, it was not the A team, and uh, and so. We said, hello, and so we go up the stairs, and so now we're talking. Gav's telling the stories in the film room, and all of a sudden, the door swings open, and there's a naked girl standing there, and it looked like she might have been on a substance, and, and she says, hey, Gav's standing there holding his drink, and she looks, she goes, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and I said, oh, yeah, I think your dressing room's across the way. You're in the wrong room. She says, I'm, I'm sorry, and she goes to close the door, and then she opens it, and she says, you boys coming to the show? And Gav sold his drink, and he says, uh, I think we're going to wait for the headliner. <laughs> <laughs> First time, he, I grew up on the same street as Don Gavin in West Roxbury. Uh -huh. uh, we went to the same high school. Yeah. This guy is, I used to see him at Nick's Comedy Stop all the time, never knew him, didn't. So now I'm working in comedy, and Don Gavin's performing at the He's headlining at the uh, at the Grill 93. He didn't never performed at Light Ships. Yeah, he liked to be paid, and so uh, we, the Grill 93 is headlining for the weekend. I'm so excited. Like my parents come, everybody comes, and so now he's there. I'm so I introduced myself. I said, "I'm Mr. Gavin. I'm John Tobin. I'm the manager." He says, "Oh, good." I said, um, "I'll uh, I'll I'm going to bring up the first person, and then I'm going to go up in between the second and third, and you and the headliner, and I'm going to talk about the dinner and show packages, and then." I'm going to introduce you. He says, okay, okay, okay. He says, you get a pen and a piece of paper? I said, oh, yeah, sure. So I go up and get a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> he says, okay, your name's John Tobin. <laughs> you're the manager, right? You're the manager. And uh, you're going to go up. So you're going to go up at the beginning. And then, then you're going to talk about the dinner and show <laughs> pack. Then you're going to. Oh, am I, so now it dawns on me. He's shitting on me. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I went, oh. God, right? <laughs> but it was such an it was such an honor to be shit on by Don Gavin. I felt like I had arrived, right? That I was in it. Uh, a couple of years, about five or six years ago, Michigan State, the defending national basketball champions, are playing Northeastern. Yeah. Uh, 
at Northeastern. Northeastern seats the 4,500 people. It's like Hoosiers, mm -hmm. right? Michigan State walks in. You know, 45,000. 4,500. That's what Matthews Arena sits. Oh, okay. So Michigan State walks in this barn, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's the oldest working arena in the world. Uh huh. And so the Celtics and Bruins both started there. It's got a great history to it, and it's on our campus. So I had four tickets for the game. I didn't know where they were. One of my colleagues gave them to me, and the day my wife and one of my boys couldn't go, and so I was taking I was taking Matthew, and uh, he calls me up. Gab calls me up. He's a big hoop fan. Yeah. And he's a big gambler. He played hoops in he college, did. right? He did. Yeah. And uh, he played at played a Catholic Memorial too. Uh huh. He was the last cut on the 1965 undefeated. CM basketball team, state champions. Oh, no kidding. Their only loss that year was to Lou Alcinda in Powell Memorial. Oh, right, in 65. right. Um, it still grates on Gav to this day, and uh, I try not to bring it up. So he calls me up. He says, I said, I happen to have two extra tickets, Gav. He said, I'm going to bring a friend. I said, great. So I meet him in the lobby. As it turns out, we're sitting right behind the Michigan State bench. And it's just, it's a, the, Tom Mizzo, the coach of Michigan State, is a nut. Uh -huh. He's screaming at his players while the game's going on. It's just watching him coach was something, right? Yeah. So Gab, before the game, he says, got a little index card. His friend, he says, uh, all right, John, I just probably don't want to know this, but um, the over-under on, over on today's contest is 126 and a half, and we have the under. And I said, okay, great. So the first half is a defensive struggle, and uh, I said, I lean over Gab. I said, hey, Gab, looks good. He goes, a lot of time left, my old boy, a lot of time, right? I said, okay. Sure enough, gets to the end of the game. It's about 90 seconds left. Michigan State's blowing us out, blowing Northeastern out now. And the game's not in question anymore. But the total's at 122. Michigan State grabs a Northeastern miss, a rebound. They go to go up the court. Gav stands up and says, all right, boys, slow it down. Four corners. Going to the four corners. No rush here. No rush. Screaming it out. And they won. Right? <laughs> He's screaming it out. The coach is like, you're the fourth there behind the Michigan State bench, right? So he calls me up the next day. He says, uh, it turns out whenever he goes to a game, he tapes the game and watches the game uh -huh. afterwards. And he says, he's got some things I like to, some things I missed when I was there, I like to see mm -hmm. on TV. And I, he said, uh, he said, uh, they, I saw you on, I saw you in the game. I said, well, I was sitting right next to you again. I said, it was probably, I, I said, they were probably uh, showing Coach Izzo. He goes, no, I think they were showing you. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course you'll coach, show Coach Izzo. <laughs> like, you idiot. <laughs> right? just, like, just like. That's well, amazing. I've had some of the greatest conversations with him. Yeah. And just his history and where he's been and what he's done. I remember and one night at Nick's Comedy Stop, he was on stage and there was a heckler. Uh -huh. And then Don annihilates the guy. So the guy comes up on stage and he takes a swing at Don. Yep. And a couple guys grab him, and of course, Nick's comedy stop um, always had cops. They they always had cops in the back because they were because it's in the red light district, so they're supposed to be arresting pimps and you know drug dealers. But instead, they're in the back of Nick's because it's January in Boston, and they're watching and they the friends, show. They were friends with the comics. Oh, they were. They partied with them. They love Don. Yep. So they see Don get swung at. They grab the guy. They pull him off stage. And now Don finishes his set. His sets, he's got another 20 minutes left. He finishes his set. He gets off stage, and he sees one of the cops, and the cop goes, hey, Don, come here. Come here a second. And he takes him around the corner, and they walk down a hallway into, like, a, 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 clo a, a coat closet, and he opens up the door, and there's the guy that took a swing at him. And he's got his hands cuffed behind his back, and one of the cops says to Don, why don't you take a couple cuts? And Don walks up and just lights the guy's belly up, and yep. then just turns around and walks out, and then they went and arrested the guy. That was it. <laughs> that was gone. It was great. He uh, went, but I also love his honesty and like he'll, you know, I I had put on a few pounds several years ago, and yeah. I walk into the green room, the Cape Cod Millie tent. He goes, Ah, getting a little uh, a little tubby there, huh? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, it's just devastating yeah, to hear yeah, it from Don Gavin, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a uh, there's a famous Boston comedy promoter. We, we, Green me nameless. Uh, used to have front row seats of the garden at the Celtics game. So Gav was at the game, this is years ago, with a couple of his buddies, and he's sitting on the aisle. He has good seats, too, and sitting there watching the game, and this famous promoter comes up uh, up the stairs, and he sees Gav, and he looks down at Gav. He says, well, hello there, Gav. And Don says, hello, so-and-so. 
and he says, uh, he says, uh, we should work together sometime. And Gav says, uh, no, we tried that, and uh, now it's not happening. No more. <laughs> and the promoter says, uh, Gav, you really hate my guts, don't you? And Gav says, you know, hate's a really strong word. I don't hate anyone, but I intensely dislike you. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy who has no soul, he just walked away. Oh, I love it. <laughs> All right, well, listen, John Tobin, I intensely like you. I love I'm, you, Fitz. It's I'm great. I'm honored that you're on the show. You've always been just one of my favorite people and one of the funniest people I know. And, you know, you've done a, the Boston comedy scene has evolved, as you know, over the last 35 years. It's gone through some high points. It's gone through some low points. Sure. And, I, and I think at a time when comedy was struggling in this city, you kept the lantern lit and you kept the rooms open and you've created a place here that is as good as any club in the country, and I'm, I'm happy and proud to come back here and always love spending time with you. Oh, it's great. Thank you. It's, it's, such a, it's an honor to be on this with you. Uh, love you. Uh, they, it's an honor to be part of Boston Comedy, just to be part of the specialness of it. It's done so much for my life yeah. and the people I've met that I ordinarily wouldn't have met. You know, people from all walks of life who've you know, given me great perspectives, but I think you guys are the comics are the truth tellers in this world. Mm -hmm. Question the absurd and the status quo, challenge stuff. And it just made me think in a different way, uh, in so many different ways. And But it's also made me see the humor in just about everything. Right, including, right. Including, but that helps you get through things. Yep. That helps you get through things. So I'm, I'm really grateful. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks, Fitz. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>